coming over the field from the west side about 8,000 feet high of these twin engine bombers. And uh, some of the guys looked down and said, oh, look at the Navy up there. The Navy? Look at those red spots under the wings. Those are not Navy. <laughs> anyway, they patterned on the field. They just made one run. And uh, the lead uh, plane gives them the signal. They all start dropping their bombs. And like, a, like a hitting a checkerboard. And then they went on their way. They only made one run. But behind them came a bunch of dive bombers, single engine bombers, zeros, and, and, and they were diving and strafing and trying to get everything that was left there that the big bombers hadn't got, which they had did a lot. And they, they, did, they got most of our planes at that time. I jumped into a foxhole. By then there was one diving on me. So I started firing him, but I'd never fired a machine gun before. They didn't have any tracers, so I couldn't tell where I was hitting. So I went up and down and back and forth on him as he came by. And sure enough, after he passed out of his dive, he was on fire. And uh, for this, I was awarded a, a silver star. Anyway, after fighting for four months, everything ran out. Ammunition, food, clothing, medicine, the whole thing. And uh, so we ended up facing the surrender. On this march, it was a 65-mile forced march. They didn't use any food or any water. And uh, these men, a lot of them were so weak, they'd go along so far and they just dropped down on the side of the road because they couldn't go any further. Well, the Japanese guards would come along with a bayonet on his rifle and they'd poke them a little bit. If they didn't get up and go, they'd just push it through, then pull them off the side of the road. There was dead bodies all along the the route there for 65 miles. And this, I guess, where it got its name for the infamous death march. A man would put a bayonet through a man, take his life, and not show any more emotion than you and I would stomping on a cockroach, you know? It's really, it's really hard when a man loses around 100 pounds. I weighed 180 pounds before the war was in real good shape. And uh, at one time, I got down to 97 pounds. If you can imagine, just not much more than a skeleton. I found a little Bible. It was just a small pocket-sized Bible, and, but it had the Old and New Testament in it, and I uh, put it in my pocket quickly and kept it, and took it back down there with us. They would do uh, these strip searches, these shakedown um, searches, where they would, they would make you take off all your clothes, all your belongings, and put them out in front of you, and everybody would stand in file, just naked as the day you were born, so you couldn't hide anything. And they would always find my dad's Bible, and he got it back every single time and kept it to this day. He literally witnessed prisoners sit down and die. He never gave up. So he decided right there that he was going to forgive everything and everybody that did anything to him. He was going to come home and start his life anew and, and just not worry about it. He was trustworthy. He was loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. He was every one of those things. He was uh, so appreciative of this country and the freedoms we enjoy. He often says, you know what, I'm not a hero, I don't consider myself a hero, I'm a very well-blessed survivor. He is truly our hero for everything else he's done. I've known Harold for about 40 years and wouldn't have one bad thing to say about him. He looked at everyone and he said, well, they tried to kill me, but they didn't succeed. That in the 40 years, Harold Poole never had one cross word to say to me, we will all miss him a lot. We had 200 men in our outfit. And out of the 200 men, only about one-fourth of them came back.